thank you very much. My name is Rachel Healy. I'm with the ACLU of Maine. That's the American Civil Liberties Union of Maine. Uh, let me be the first to wish you all a very happy Constitution Day. Um, we're so glad that you're here. This is a pretty exciting new thing we're doing. We're going to be offering you this very exciting panel, and in a minute you'll hear a little bit more about our speakers. We're also streaming this event online today so that students around the state can tune in from their own schools wherever they are, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and I just want to take a minute to thank the Maine Humanities Council. They've given us a grant to make this possible. So I'm going to turn it over to your student body president, Alex Smith, who has a few things to say, and then we'll get started. So welcome to Deering, everyone, if you're streaming or in the audience. Uh, Deering High School is one of the most diverse high schools in the state of Maine and north of Boston. With over 30 homes and languages spoken, our students come from all over the world. At Deering, we learn to live, and we learn to live with each other. As members of the International Studies School Network, Deering is proud to partner with the American Civil Liberties Union to bring you today's conversation on the 14th Amendment. This Friday, September 16th, marks the 229th anniversary of the signing of our Constitution. We are coming together today at Deering to celebrate Constitution Day with our guests. These include Reza Jalili, who is the coordinator of Multicultural Student Affairs at the University of Southern Maine. He's the author of several books and a play. He was born in Kurdistan, an Iranian province, where he was persecuted for his attempts to uphold his national identity, including speaking and writing in Kurdish. He fled Iran for college in India and eventually made his way to New England. After gaining refugee status, he became a US citizen. He has been working, writing, and advocating for immigrants in the United States for over 30 years. Let's hear it for him. Our second guest is Dr. Eileen Egan. She is the Associate Professor of History in the Department of History and Political Science at USN. She's been teaching there for 30 years, and her research and teachings interests include urban history, public art, historical representation, and 20th century US history. She has published scholarships on the history of students and higher education, interpretations of women's history in public art, and Irish women's immigration to Maine. She is a co-founder of the Portland Women's History Trail, and she has an interest in digital history and a way to provide more access for people to connect with their past and its meaning. <laughs> Zach Hyden is the legal director of the ACLU of Maine. He has brought court cases to defend the civil rights and civil liberties of artists, immigrants, journalists, pregnant women, prisoners, protesters, religious minorities, students, and whistleblowers. Thank you, Alex. Okay, now we're going to turn it over to our panelists. You'll hear from each of them, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. You can just raise your hand and then I'll call on you to stand and ask your question. We may also get some questions from the folks online, so they'll just be typing in their questions and then I'll read those out loud too. Uh, so without further ado. I'll try not to spill my water on the microphone. Uh, hi, I'm glad to see you all today. Uh, and to talk about, uh, my part of the talk is to talk about the history of immigration to Maine, and I'll leave the Constitution to my colleagues. Um, the, uh, in 1854, uh, some nice Mainers burned down a Catholic church in Bath because they didn't like the Irish Catholic immigrants who'd come to Maine, and burning down a church seemed like a good response. About the same time, up further uh, in Ellsworth, they tarred and feathered a Jesuit priest, who also was actually from Switzerland, but it represented the French and Irish immigrants to Maine, who seemed to be a threat to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who controlled Maine at the time. These represented the kind of hostile response of people in Maine to newcomers. Uh, it's a hostility that goes back to a long time in Maine history, and that has by no means disappeared, as I'm sure some of you know. Uh, the other side of that story, though, is that there have been welcoming moments of immigrants to Maine, uh, but they vary from time to time and people to people. 
The other important thing looking at immigration in Maine is that there's two areas. One area has to do with legislation on the federal level of who is allowed to come to the United States and then who comes to Maine and the liberalization of that or the restrictions on that. And the other thing has to do with the social attitudes, the beliefs, the ideas, and ultimately the concept of what, is it, what does it mean to be an American? Uh, and these also have changed over time. Uh, in Maine, like most of the country, there have been waves of immigration. Uh, immigration is a funny word because if you're a Native American who's been here 6,000 years or 12,000 years, uh, where do you see yourself in that? You might in fact say there have been waves of invasion. We could think of the first colonists as having been invaders rather than immigrants. Uh, so the monument to George Cleves has, uh, that's on the, uh, the Eastern Palm has sort of, sort of double meaning depending who you are. Uh, we also tend sometimes to call immigrants uh, by other names too. They could be the colonists, they could be the settlers. Uh, but in fact, uh, John Kennedy in the 1960s may have been right to say that we're basically a nation of immigrants and it's a good idea to keep it in mind. In Maine, as in the United States, the first wave were the English settlers, some French settlers, and some Scots-Irish settlers. But by the, 19, uh, by the, 1900, the 1800s, the first wave of big immigrants to Maine were both the French coming from Quebec and coming from uh, some from Acadia, and then the Irish immigrants coming in the 1840s to escape famine and British imperialism. Uh, those groups were met with some hostility, and alas, they also got pitted against each other sometimes, most noticeably in Lewiston, Auburn, where the Irish and the French came into some conflict, uh, a conflict that gets replicated in other ways later. Uh, in later years, the immigrants who had some degree of Chinese immigration to Maine, although it's not as much as to the West, but by the turn of the century, you had more of the French coming down from Quebec, and you had, as in the rest of the country, immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. That meant you were getting Italians who moved to parts of Bunjoy Hill, for those of you, I guess most of you are in, living in Portland. Uh, you also got waves of Eastern European Jews coming to Portland, also living pretty much on Munjoy Hill. Uh, you began to get some other ethnic groups, the Armenians who moved and lived in Portland. Uh, there's a monument to the Armenian community and Armenian genocide that's on uh, Congress Street that's worth, worth noting. Yes. Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, anyway, these waves of immigration then in the 20th century it gets stopped by a federal legislation that first, the first group that gets excluded are Chinese women, interestingly enough. The next group that they get excluded are Asians. And in 1924, it's essentially we get a biased kind of immigration restriction act that favors people from Northern and Western Europe. Uh, when we move after the Civil War, after the World War II, we get some opening thanks to the Cold War. John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson then also throw up the quotas, and you get a whole new movement of immigration. So as most of you know, that Maine now has immigrants coming uh, more from African countries, from Latin American countries, Central American countries, and from Asia, immigrants who really were not part of the fabric so much in the first immigrants, but many of whom get the same kind of treatment as the early Irish and French got by the nativists and the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. So when we think about immigration and think about these waves and think about the Ku Klux Klan in particular, the attitudes of racism, religious bigotry, and hostility um, get interwoven with the struggles of all of those groups basically to win their own place, but also to keep their own identity. Uh, whether they're Irish or whether they're Somali, whether they're French or whether they're Armenian, the idea that you can be an American and also maintain your own culture, your religion, uh, your language, all of these things are part of the story of American immigration to me. Thank you, Dr. Egan. Thank you.
Good morning. I understand I only have five minutes, and as Dr. Abdullahi, my, my friend and teacher, who is the assistant to principal at Daring, is fond of saying, with immigrants, it just takes 10 minutes for us to just introduce ourselves and who we are and our names and, and start to socialize. So with that uh, said, uh, I was born in Iran, as it was mentioned in the introduction. And uh, this was during the Shah of Iran, and during his uh, dictatorship rule, I was accused of writing poetry, uh, which sounded political. And for that reason, I did not feel safe to live in Iran, and my family encouraged me to leave Iran. I was in my teens to go to India to continue my studies. And uh, while in India, I had every intention to go back to Iran once my education was completed. Uh, but there was a so-called Islamic Revolution of 1979, closely followed by the Iran-Iraq War of 1980. Um, so once I had completed my education, I had no country to go back to. Uh, I was a stateless person and, uh, as a young man. So I came to the United States as, as a refugee. I came to Maine, Portland, Maine, and, uh, and soon I realized that uh, not every gaze was friendly. And at times when I was walking down Congress Street, people were questioning my humanity. It seemed like they were telling me that you don't belong here, go back. They didn't have to say it, the looks were enough. And, uh, and of course there was a balance there. The neighbors were graceful and kind and generous and, and helped me to, to start a brand new life. And, uh, but at times I felt as a stranger, I still do. And I came in early June, late May, and uh, many of us who have lived in May know that once you go through a very cold winter, once you get to early spring, you start shedding layers of clothing. And so I gotta tell you, some of the stairs that I was subject to, th th there was a reason that I was really a sight to look at. The reason being that, uh, again, uh, this was uh, relatively warm for me. The temperature was in the uh, low 60s. And the people around me were bearing uh, skin, there were men, shirtless men wearing chesty hair, and there should be a law against that, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and here I was uh, wearing a couple of sweaters, because you see, I had come from India, when the temperature had been in the hundreds and nineties, and the sixties in Maine felt intolerably cold compared to the temperature in India. So I must confess that some of the stairs were because really I, I looked quite strange walking around wearing many, many sweaters, layers of sweaters. Uh, but on a serious, more serious note, as a Muslim immigrant, uh, life changed for many, many of us once 9 11 happened. And we just marked the anniversary of that. Uh, we went to bed one night as Americans, as American citizens, as residents of this great state only to wake up the following day and be seen as public enemy number one. Such simple acts as going to one's mosque became a risky business. We were pulled out of the airport lines. We were suspected of disloyalty to the state, not because we had done anything wrong, just because a bunch of criminals had committed an atrocity. And for that reason alone, we all were accused of being disloyal to our new country. In many ways, the life in Maine and America started to resemble the life we had left behind. You see, many, many of us as immigrants and as refugees and asylum seekers come to this country to be left alone, to begin a new life, and uh, to be trusted, to be given a chance. And overnight, right after 9-11, overnight, life here became very similar to what we had left behind, or what we had thought we had left behind. We were denied jobs, promotions, housing, opportunities, just again because we belong to this particular faith tradition.
that we shared with us criminals. And uh, as my friend Eileen mentioned, uh, Maine has this really love and hate relationship with immigrants. We have had those cases of a Catholic church being burned down in Bath, Maine, and the incident in Ellsworth a few months later. But there are also other notable incidents that, has, that have happened, taken place in Maine. You see, the Know Nothing Party, a nativist group in Maine, was very, very active. And some of the language and narrative that the states we hear resemble what, what those individuals and groups were saying. The KKK, for example, very active in the 1920s with the headquarters in, on Forest Avenue, where the Burger King stands now. They had a large headquarter. And, uh, and what is strange, because we had very, very few African Americans in Maine, and the target, in this case in Maine, were the Catholics, the Irish, the Jews, the newly arrived Jews, Jewish refugees who had come from Europe, escaping the Holocaust. So, you see, the, the victims really, the victims here in this case were different. They were not African Americans, but there were others who were made to feel as outsiders, as marginalized. And what is interesting and unique, I wouldn't call it interesting, but it's really heartbreaking, is that we as Muslims are now being accused of not belonging here. That there's something about our faith tradition would make us uh, not really becoming good citizens. And, uh, and then the same narrative, in fact, word for word, were being said about the Catholics in this country about the Jews, that they cannot possibly be good Americans, that they would come and, and change our society and force us to convert to their way of life and force us to accept them and so on and so forth. So it's, it's really heartbreaking that what they were saying about the Catholics of the past, the Jews of the past, are being said about us, the Muslims. And that's really important to remember. So, we continue to remain hopeful. I feel as American as everyone else in this room. Just because I was born elsewhere, that should not make me an outsider. Just because I pray five times a day, as opposed to others doing it on a Sunday, I should not be seen as un-American. Thank you. Zach Hyden. I am a lawyer uh, at the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union here in Maine. And I can't help but think as I'm, as I'm looking out uh, of what it was like being in your position. It wasn't that long ago for me where I was in high school and I would be attending um, you know, an, an event at an auditorium. And I didn't know then what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. Uh, when I grew up, but I knew for sure, as sure as I knew anything, that it was, I definitely did not want to be a lawyer. Uh, that was something I was certain of, and it was only much later that that certainty sort of faded away. I am a uh, particular type of lawyer. I'm a lawyer who does constitutional law. I practice constitutional law, which basically means that I go with people, with people whose rights have been violated. Uh, I walk with them into court uh, you know, with a copy of the Constitution in my hand, and I tell the court, tell a judge, that that person's rights have been violated. Something in the Constitution that is promised them, or some prohibition in the Constitution, uh, is not being followed. And then I ask judges to protect people's rights. And heard in the introduction some of the work that I've done. But the, the part that's important for, for you to know in terms of this presentation today is that the Constitution for me is a tool. It's a tool that I use in my work to protect people's rights. Uh, and uh, lately, uh, because of some of the things that Reza just talked about, 
often the groups that I'm going into court to protect are immigrants. Uh, and there is a provision in the Constitution that we're here to talk about today that guarantees that the government not discriminate against people who are immigrants. And that is a guarantee that is too often uh, not followed by our political leaders, by our government uh, at the local or state or federal level. So lawyers have to go into court uh, as immigrants or with immigrants to demand that the rights guaranteed in the Constitution that protect against discrimination against immigrants be followed. You probably don't, if you th think about the Constitution or learn about the Constitution in school, necessarily learn about it as a tool, right? You might learn about it as a, in your government class, as a political document that sets out the relationship between the branches of government uh, and the relationship between the states and the federal government, and then it has that Bill of Rights section at the end that talks about freedom of speech, but about, uh, it's a governing document. Or maybe you learn about the Constitution uh, as a historical document. It was written a bunch of years ago, it was signed on this date, uh, and then it was subject to amendment uh, over the course of 200 and something years. Uh, one of those amendments is the one that we're, is I think the main topic of our discussion today, the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment, as you probably all know, was adopted after the Civil War. The Civil War was fought and more Americans died than in any other war in our history. And after that, Congress uh, realized that there was a need to change the Constitution. There was a need to amend the Constitution. One of the things that they changed right after the Civil War was to add this guarantee that everybody would get equal protection of the law, which means that the government is not allowed to discriminate against groups that it doesn't like, whether it's racial groups or religious groups or immigrant groups. We know about the racial part, right? That's the part of the Civil War that we usually think about, but the history that Eileen and Reza mentioned that, had, that was happening with the, the Know Nothing Party, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, the Rise of the Klan, those were, that was history that was also happening right around the same time, the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, when the country was also debating uh, racial discrimination. It's common to think about how um, the immigrant experience is a, a long part of our country. And many of you whose families are immigrants, you yourselves may be immigrants, you can feel, I think, a lot of connection to America, that there is this long immigrant experience. Um, the Irish, the Germans, the Chinese, the Italians, the Spanish, uh, the Eastern European Jewish refugees, the Muslim more recent refugees, African refugees, Vietnamese refugees. Sadly enough, anti-immigrant work is also a long part of our history. And the fight against immigrants, efforts by government leaders in cities and towns and states and at the federal level to make immigrants feel like they're less worthwhile, less worthy, less American, is also, sadly, a long part of our history. It's been with us since nearly the beginning. But we have these tools to fight back against that. And for those of you who are experiencing that anti-immigrant feeling, you can know that generations before you have experienced that too and have fought back against it successfully and have asserted themselves as part of the core American experience and have really made this country the great place that it is. Uh, they, that have made us so successful. Uh, in so many ways and have, have made this country so great. So uh, being an immigrant and fighting against anti-immigrant experiences is really, sadly, a, a long part of what this country uh, is about, but it is also part of what has made us so successful. Okay, thank you, Zach, and thanks again to all of our speakers.
So we're going to open it up to questions. I want to remind you again, we have Eileen Egan, Reza Jalali, and Zach Hyden. If you have any questions, you can just raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you and then uh, try and just ask your question as loudly as you can, and I'll repeat it so our panelists can answer it. And I also want to remind anyone who is tuning in via the internet that you have the opportunity to um, press the little question mark icon on the right side of your screen and then you can type in a question there and we'll be reading those as well. So, um, who wants to get things started? Fantastic, right there in the third row. Hi, um, this is sort of a question for Zach and Reza. Um, does the 14th Amendment apply to refugees as well as immigrants? And for Reza, have you experienced that at all? Thank you. So the question was about whether the 14th Amendment applies to refugees and also about Reza's own personal experience with, with his rights here in the United States. Yes, the 14th Amendment applies to uh, anyone who is in the United States, uh, period. It, apply, it, it provides its greatest level of protection for people who are lawfully present in the United States. Uh, so people who are here, who come into this country lawfully through the immigration process, either because they're seeking asylum, or they come in as refugees, or they come in as lawful permanent residents, uh, or any of the number of ways that people come into this country uh, legally are entitled to the full protection of the 14th Amendment. Even people who come in under questionable circumstances, whose immigration status may be in doubt, are still entitled to some protection by the 14th Amendment. So it's a very expansive uh, protection that we get under the Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, Equal Protection Clause. Uh, in my case, sadly, I have experienced uh, some of the acts of racism and Islamophobia. Uh, I'll, I'll just share one with you that I used to work for the state of Maine years ago and I went to a gas station outside of Augusta and this is right after 9-11 and to, to buy gas and the owner of the gas station came out with a baseball bat saying that I don't sell gas to da 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 da, -da Arabs and, and I started to laugh because I'm not an Arab so Iranians are not Arabs. I'm a Muslim, yes, but I'm not an Arab. And, and I, I think my laughter made him much more angry. He didn't expect that. And, but I realized, so I was about to tell him that, look, buddy, I'm not an Arab, so good for you not selling gas to Arabs, but hey, I'm not an Arab, so you should gas, sell gas to me. Uh, but I realized that was not a teachable moment. As I um, so I thought I should better be in my car. So I, I drove away, and, but really what I see now and, and, and keeps me up at night is how some of my students at USM, at the University of Southern Maine, are, are being treated. Uh, I work with multicultural students, mostly New Mainers, New Americans, immigrants, and in particular those of them who wear the veil, the hijab, young Muslim women who are wearing the hijab, uh, come to my office, and there's a lot of crying going on in my office these days, to my despair, and uh, dismay. And so uh, they tell me to share stories with me of how, right at USM, in our own three campuses, uh, they're being called names, go back uh, to your country, and, and many, many other ugly things, and that really bothers me. And I thought as a society we had evolved to reach a point that, that whatever a woman chooses to do with her body, what she would like to wear or not to wear, is her decision and no one else's. And, and yet, uh, Muslim young women are not the soft targets. And I, I can walk around and not be mistaken for a Muslim. I have the name privilege. Uh, in terms of skin color, shadism, I'm, I'm not that dark, and so I enjoy all those privileges. My, my students don't, my female students don't. And that, that's where, that, that really, that I'm very worried 
Plus, I have two children. I'm growing up two children in Maine, and I always looked at them, and I continue to look at them as Mainers. They were born here. And then for me to see that one day they would be also targeted really, really bothers me. We have other questions from the audience? Right there. Um, focusing more on the racial side of the 14th Amendment, what is your opinion on the Black Lives Matter movement and your own privilege? So the question was about feelings regarding the Black Lives Matter movement and and the privilege of the people sitting on the stage. That's it. Thank you for that question. Um, would you like to take a shot at that? Right. I can't really relate it so much to the constitutional issue, but I think when I was talking about immigration, one of the points I should have mentioned and, and will now is that if we're talking about immigration, we need to remember that a large part of Americans didn't immigrate on purpose. They were brought here by coercion uh, with the slave trade. And so their experiences in a nation of immigrants are quite different, uh, and we might well say even worse than people who had some degree of coercion through starvation or imperialism. But there's no getting around the fact that black lives in America have different experiences and a different history that requires, requires uh, recognition than dealing with white people or uh, immigrants in general. Personally, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is excellent. Uh, nobody's perfect, you know, people are always doing things. I think, why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? But the idea of focusing on, uh, on being visible and, and assertive is, I think, all to the good and is part of a long tradition of groups, whether they're ethnic groups or women's groups, of trying to bring about change, not by, uh, not by hiding, but by asserting yourselves. And of course, it's true that, that uh, I'd certainly speak to my own privilege, not only of being white, but being old. Um, although sometimes I think if I'd gone to Harvard, I would have had more privilege uh, than I do. Thank you. Um, and I just want to remind everyone who's watching online that you can uh, ask questions via that question box there. Zach, did you want to add something to that? Sure. I'll add something just to connect it back to the 14th Amendment. Uh, one thing, if you, if you go back and you look at the, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court cases, right after the 14th Amendment is adopted, and it's right after the Civil War, uh, the, 14th, the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, the 14th Amendment guarantees equal protection, the 15th Amendment guarantees uh, black people the right to vote, and there's a, a whole bunch of Supreme Court cases interpreting these, these laws. And it was about 15 years later, in the early uh, 1880s, where the US Supreme Court essentially said, you know what, I think we've achieved racial equality in this country. I think the work that we thought needed to be done after the Civil War, we're pretty much there. Uh, and then, you know, it was another 70 years before the court got around to saying that, oh, maybe we shouldn't have segregated schools in this country. And still now, 60 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, there's still so much racial discrimination in this country. There's so many racial divisions in this country uh, that we're still uh, trying to live up to that promise, that idea that, that uh, you know, was born out of that energy after the Civil War. Uh, but it's you know, as old as equal protection, as old as the idea of of abolishing racial discrimination is this idea that you still hear on TV where people say, nah, I think it's I think we're all fixed. I think it's all I think we're all set on this. And I think most of us our experiences is that no it's not all fixed yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. Are there more questions in the audience? Okay, I'm gonna just end it on, on one final question then because we're actually almost out of time anyway. So I just want to thank all of you again for being here and all of you who tuned in and everyone who made this possible. Um, and I think my final question is, we've heard uh, some stories of, of hope. We've also heard some stories of sadness and discrimination and challenge um, and being mistreated by uh, our fellow Americans. Um, despite those stories, the 14th Amendment exists 
and it offers us all some protections. Do you all take comfort in the fact that we have this document that we can go back to that has this promise of equal protection despite the challenges that you might face or that you know that other people face in their daily lives? And if each of you has something to offer, that'd be great. I'd like to start with Reza. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I had to mention, I should have mentioned this earlier, that despite some of those uh, acts of racism that I did mention, this is still the greatest country for me to live in. That, that I'm really, every morning I, I wake up and I'm and, and counting my blessings for, here, for being here. I write, I, I still write and publish something that I could have not done in my own country of birth. So just think about that for a second. As a writer, I get to write here I don't need the government's permission, the state's permission. I don't have to go to the office of censorship. And that's the case in so many countries, including my country of birth, Iran. So that, that's what I love about America, the fact that we can sit down here and discuss this and talk about Black Lives Matter without fearing that we'll be followed home by the secret police. So there's so much great about this society. Are we perfect? Of course not. But we have to understand that this, is, this continues to be one of the most wonderful and open, inclusive society. We may not be totally welcoming, but at least we're tolerant. And that's just, we have come a long way. Uh, just to give an example, back in 1936, the hotels and resorts in Maine would not rent a room to a Jewish tourist. Just think about it. When we look back, we think, that is, that, that's crazy that a hotel owner would have a policy and understanding that the staff follow. This made it to the national headlines, by the way. Years after years, the hotels in Maine would not offer accommodation to a Jewish, Jewish tourist. Now, we, we know that. That's crazy. That's so uncool. So my hope is that in years to come, we look back and say, what about all the things were said about Muslims, about immigrants, in the, in the early 2000s, that, that was uncool, that was crazy, there was no need for that. Well, I'd like to be the devil's advocate slightly because um, the, th the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were the ones that first added the word male to the U.S. Constitution. And so from the point of view of women and gender, they were a mixed blessing, we'd have to say. Nonetheless, I think we can say that the, the virtue of the Constitution is that it can be reinterpreted and we can, in fact, change things. We never got the Equal Rights for Women <laughs> Amendment passed, but in fact, we've had ways of pushing changes so that we might, in fact, uh, succeed in having a woman elected president despite the best efforts of people not to, I can't help it. Um, <laughs> but race raised a good point too, is that when we look at immigration and discrimination, it is often women because they're visible in their identity uh, who get subject to those attacks. It was like the Chinese women who got excluded or single women who were considered that they might be prostitutes if they didn't come uh, with men or with their family. And so when we're thinking of this, we still need both legal and constitutional protection dealing with issues of gender, uh, as well as race and class. Thank you. Well, you know, I want to continue on with that idea of, of rebirth and tying it to this, um, our topic today, which is the, the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. When it came time for the 200th anniversary of the Constitution in the 1980s, the late 1980s, uh, there was a lot of celebrations planned. There were events planned, speeches in high schools, I'm sure, about the 200th anniversary of our founding document, the Constitution. And Thurgood Marshall, who was the greatest civil rights lawyer in our nation's history, and who at the time then was a, was a justice, had taken his place as a justice on the US Supreme Court, said essentially that this was a nonsense anniversary, 
it was not an anniversary he had any interest in celebrating. Because the Constitution that was adopted in 1789 legalized slavery. It said that black people would only be counted as three-fifths of a person. And that, to him, was not a document worth celebrating. The real Constitution for him was born after the Civil War. Uh, the Constitution to him that was worth celebrating didn't really start until the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, and then eventually the 19th Amendment, which uh, gave women the right to vote. Uh, that, is, that is the anniversary that we should be celebrating, and that's the Constitution that we should look to. And it's important to remember that America is a process, and that our government and our laws and the protections that come from those laws are constantly developing and constantly in flux. And we all have a choice in our lives. Uh, this is a democracy. We all get to participate about whether we're going to be the sort of people that try to hold back that change, uh, that try to fight against those developments, or the sort of people who try to push them forward and push forward the idea that the Constitution protects more and more people and more and more groups and making the Constitution, the promise of the Constitution, available to everyone. Thanks a lot.